so much if you've been on the Jay's analysis ride. A lot of you guys are new. I understand. That's cool. Glad to have you here. But some of you have been with me for the long haul. In fact, there are some who've been with Jay's analysis for 10 years, reading it back in the day. And we've come a long way. We've come a long way. All right. Welcome. Thank you. Glad to see you all here. We got a room of almost 200 nerds, and I'm sure the nerds will pile in. Maybe we can get up to about 300 tonight. We'll see. It's your boy Jay in the house. Your boy can't see me. What's up, y'all? Welcome. It's your boy Jay Dyer of Jay's Analysis, hunkered down in my underground Soviet bunker, and I have with me, as always. The wonderful, the magnificent, the ominous, as you see there in that based picture, Father Deacon Dr. Ananias. How you doing, Father? Doing great. I'm hunkered down in the catacombs. <laughs> the catacombs, the underground cities with, with, underneath California. Yeah, we're doing our we're doing our services in the in the underground. Awesome. Um. Welcome, everybody. Uh, as you guys know, it is nearing that hallowed period when we almost reach 50,000. We're going to have a, a, a 50,000 nerds stream party. It will be me. Probably invite Father Deacon, uh, probably, if, if I decide he's worthy. Uh, we'll probably invite uh, Tristan. We had Tristan on for the 40,000 nerd stream. Uh, we'll probably get Hesher and Spore, Melissa and Aaron, and some other of our friends when we hit that hallowed 50K. But I want to remind you, I need you guys' help because we can't always rely on algorithmic promotion. So help me get to 50K. If you would, tell your friends and your, your nerd friends and enemies to come subscribe to Jay's Analysis. Uh, let's see if we can get to it. It seems like, I don't know exactly what happened this last week. It could have been... I heard some of the bigger channels were giving me some props. So I know we had about a thousand subs in the last four or five days. So that's actually good news. It jumped up really quick this last week. So props to whoever was giving me props. And thank you for sending all those uh, thousand subs this this uh, this last week. 
and hopefully we can continue that trend. So help me get to 50K. Help me. Uh, it, also, we will be taking uh, Super Chats. Um, we had a little bit of a dip. I guess people are maybe getting a little concerned over the issues, which is understandable. Uh, we had a little bit of a dip in the subscribers, new subscribers this last two weeks, which I think is a reaction to what's going on. So uh, if you could, we will probably need your support because this is, of course, how I make a living. And I will, I will, I will aid uh, Father Deacon as well. He will get some of these super chats if you want to support us tonight. So they're not all going to me. Thank you, thank you. Take uh, Trump's thousand, Jay. Take uh, encourage them to take Trump's thousand dollars that he's sending you and support us. Yes, Trump's going to send everybody one k. It's going to be great. It's going to be wonderful. Everybody, I want them to all get the thousand dollars. Who needs it? Uh, take that, buy Bitcoin, and then send me the Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> take trump's 1k buy bitcoin in this i'm just kidding um yes but everybody needs to send me the trump k the 1k that trump sends not your special k your trump k i don't want your special k we don't eat that uh slave slop around here none of that no ki no kibble up in here. <laughs> no kibble up in here um all right well uh do you have any words or updates or anything you want to tell us in the midst of this crisis i feel like i should say ask our our cleric present uh any ideas or words on this <laughs> uh oh i sneeze i got the coronavirus oh, is a sneeze oh. a symptom i don't even know i don't think it is uh it says my it says my computer is infected with a virus jay <laughs> you're supposed to wear a mask covid.exe yes you got covid19.exe on your computer Hey, everybody, just don't panic. Yeah. Um, we'll be all right. The church has survived uh, much worse things than this. Uh, uh, just think that we're trying to nip this in the bud and get the numbers down. Um, listen to your priests and bishops. I know uh, almost all jurisdictions are starting to shut down uh, services to laity, in, in which case <laughs> clergy will be doing, we will be doing liturgies for you. Uh, praise God, you know, um, some of the, for example, as of now, um, our Romanian Episcopate is still doing services, Rocor, um, and but we listen to our bishops, so, and we pray for them, and be praying uh, that they make good decisions, and that, uh, pray for everybody, too, that uh, yes. we don't panic, it's, and, and that we get through this okay. And if you do panic, send me all your Bitcoins. Yeah, exactly. If you're going to panic, give me your, all Just, your money. Yeah, because you're not going to need it. You're going nuts. Yeah. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. All right. So yeah. we have, uh, as many of you know, Father Deacon and I are going to put together a book, uh, hopefully by this year. That's our goal. Or, uh, I'm putting together another book with Father Peter Hears as well at the same time. So hopefully we can get both these done. Uh, I guess if we're under quarantine for <laughs> months and months and months, worst case scenario, there'll be plenty of time for reading and writing. Um, but one of these chapters, and you're going to want to, of course, get the book when the book comes out. But one of these chapters is, I think, going to be your excellent paper that you presented at the conference that I presented with you uh, on Orthodox knowledge, the epistemological and apologetic methods of the church fathers. So I wanted to cover that. You did a full analysis of this paper recently on your website, I'm excuse me, on your channel. Everybody, uh, if you would, you can also subscribe to Father Deacon. His link is in the show description, so be sure and uh, subscribe to his channel. But I wanted to do your paper on my channel as well. Uh, and then throw in my comments and we maybe we'll talk about what I discuss in my chapter in my paper, how the two papers really dovetail off of one another in a good way, and hopefully also resolve some of the uh, continuing confusions that relate to things like natural theology, um, um, natural law, basic beliefs, natural revelation, Hellenism, Jerusalem and Athens, um, classical foundationalism, the problems of classical foundationalism and this approach to epistemology. So hopefully we can touch on all these uh, in this stream. So why don't you start us off? Tell us what prompted you to write this essay. And let's begin with the argumentation and the thesis of the paper. Um, so obviously I want to give a shout out to um, 
you know, some of my inspirations, we have uh, Stefan in the house, in the chat, and uh, his grandfather, uh, Tristan Englehart, um, I'm indebted to um, in a lot of his work. Um, but obviously, just thinking through the issues about how we know um, things called first principles. And you have to keep in mind, too, that both Jay and I were trained in classical natural theology and classical foundationalism um, as we'd studied Roman uh, Catholic thought and what that project is. And as we became, you know, orthodox, the more that you delve into the fathers um, and the, the way that you see that they talk about what's called the Ordo Theologiae, what their project is, their apologetics, you start to see that there's a radical difference in the project. And that's kind of what started to lead me to formulate critiques of, let's say, um, natural theology. I also must say that it's, it was like a, a lot of things kind of came together. So in my grad work, um, I studied under one of the world's leading um, uh, Salerzian scholars like, and Kantian scholars. And as we're going through grad school, you know, doing a lot of stuff of philosophy of science, Sellers, um, epistemology, and where you're dealing with issues of like coherentism and uh, versus classical foundationalism, uh, I learned a lot from that. And so it always, it kind of just all congealed. Like I said, um, reading the fathers, having great mentors like Tristan Englehart, um, and various things, I started to be able to put together a project of where these two systems of epistemology and how, which is how we know, in the West versus the East are radically, fundamentally different and unbridgeable, and therefore I began to formulate a critique of Western. Theology's project of epistemology and apologetics in light of the faith of the fathers. Yeah, there it is. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so um, I, I had a similar but int more diverse sort of background. I didn't directly go into studying natural theology in terms of academia. My route was more, I began my whole theological uh, journey when I was 18, 19 with pre presuppositionalism with transcendental argumentations as a Calvinist uh, and then moved into uh, trying to reconcile that with what I saw as the, the many arguments from the patristic era for, you know, church uh, tradition and the, and the canon of scripture and hence my journey into Roman Catholicism. So I had more of a Thomistic uh, period after that Calvinistic period. And I was always trying to make these two things kind of mesh. I couldn't figure out what the relationship between natural theology, the way the church fathers use natural law and natural theology. And yet at the same time, uh, later on, seeing pretty clear critiques of natural theology in St. Maximus the Confessor, in uh, later Orthodox theologians, that a lot of people are mistaken. They think that somehow uh, God history dialectic is the first place where this is critiqued. Uh, no, there's plenty of Orthodox critiques of this prior to God history and dialectic, so that's just uh, to a position of, of total ignorance, really. I mean, you see this in Father Steineloy, the very first pages of uh, his, his uh, dogmatic theology. You see this, uh, again, all the way back to same, the, the arguments that St. Maximus makes on the Logie really are irreconcilable with the Thomistic position, as we'll see later. But um, one thing I would note is that uh, one of the first introductions I had was the, the, the Pelican book. And I always recommend this book, but people get confused because if they haven't read it, they see in the title of the book, Christianity and Classical Culture, the Metamorphosis of Natural Theology in the Christian Encounter with Hellenism. But as you note, the title itself it's not a vindication of Hellenistic natural theology. It's the metamorphosis of natural theology because it goes undergoes a change. And this is why we see every everybody from uh, Justin Martyr to Irenaeus to Basil to Athanasius all the way to St. Maximus and to St. Gregory Palamas, the consistent claim 
that natural theology or Hellenism is demonic. And yet at the same time, natural theology can be read and understood in an orthodox sense. And so that's what we want to we try to clarify today is that, again, it took me many, many years to get to the bottom of this. And I'm not trying to be some guru, but um, this is a great introduction. But, but when you read this introduction from Pelican, you're not going to necessarily have it all ironed out because it's not a matter of the term, quote, natural theology or natural law. Those words themselves are not problematic. It's all how they're understood in our paradigm. So, Father Deacon, let's get back to your paper. Um, you begin with a great quote about uh, Jerusalem and Athens and the paper from John Paul II, which will exemplify the, the excuse me, the, the encyclical, the famous encyclical, uh, Fides et Ratio. This will exemplify the culmination uh, of the Latin and scholastic and Thomistic tradition of natural theology uh, and natural law. And why is Fides et Ratio and this encyclical relevant? And how does this get explicated in the West? Yeah, so you wanted me to, the, the quote that I start my paper off with from Engelhart or the, the quote about Oh, I thought that was John Paul. Is that Engelhart? Yeah, you're right. That's yeah, from, so, that's from After God. Okay, my bad. Um, and then you go uh, to, you, but you note Tertullian, um, and we've talked about this before, Jerusalem versus Athens. But I guess what I'm asking is, what is the 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 problem? Like, why are you setting this out as? Uh, uh, do you agree with my assessment that the term natural law or natural theology is theory laden? Yeah, so, um, and this is something important to address, too, that uh, we often encounter what's called the word concept fallacy, that just because you can locate the word doesn't mean that it's uh, referent, um, and what it's referring to is the same concept. And so there's a sense in which we, we talk about, you'll find the words um, natural law, natural theology, but it doesn't mean what it means in the West um, or any other system for that matter. And that's the reason why is because a, somebody's paradigm is what gives meaning to the words. Um, and you often will see this anytime you have translators trying to translate text. Why do they come up with different um translations as far as the kind of meanings of words when they're translating it's because they're committed to certain paradigms that will color um, and therefore will color their their definitions in the way that they're going to translate and interpret various things so the idea too that i explicate in this paper is that there's nothing that's theory neutral everything's theory contaminated now it doesn't mean we fall into relativism or anything like that, but it's important to identify things in terms of their paradigms. And so, um, yeah, let's. So, so you, so let, let's talk about autonomous epistemology because this comes up pretty, pretty quickly, um, in this idea of faith and reason, right? So in, in the Roman Catholic system, uh, broadly speaking, in terms of the official, uh, philosophy that's adopted, you have two domains. You have the domain of faith and the domain of reason. And there is an overlap. And so they will usually draw this with two uh, circles with it, with the, the little, uh, you know, Venn, uh, uh, Venn diagram. Yeah. Like, thing. so it's, yeah. and they overlap to a degree. And what's in the middle there is, is, is a, an, an element of overlap. Um, but this, but this realm of nature, a natural reason, it functions autonomously, apart from and without the need for revelation to function. Yeah, let me you, let me find the actual. So they're going to say that uh, natural reason is what the the Roman Catholics and the Thomist um, will use. Now, this is this goes all the way back, clearly defined. Um, in Aquinas, um, it's explicated and defined in Vatican I, and then also in Pope John Paul II's encyclical letter. So I want to read you the quote 
here. I just need to find. I think it's also is... uh, Pastor Eternus is also the is re relevant here because Pastor Eternus is the uh, encyclical that uh, deals with. Um... Yes. Yeah. So wait, okay. Pastor, excuse me, Pastor, I always get, I get Attorney Patris and Pastor Eternus mixed up. So Attorney oh. Patris is the one that is the official acceptance of um, Thomism as the philosophy, quote unquote, of the Roman Catholic Church. Yeah, so you'll see a consistency, at least right. there. Um, here's John Paul II's encyclical letter, Fidets at Ratio, um, where he defines natural reason. Uh, natural reason depends upon sense perception. And experience. So right there, you're starting to see the kind of um, Aristotelian epistemology, uh, epistemology is kind of empiricism, mm -hmm. uh, posterioriism, that all knowledge derives from sense experience. So um, he defines that. That's a teaching uh, the church and the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church. Natural reason depends on sense perception and experience in which advances by the light of the intellect alone. So, as Jay pointed out, it's not that the West and the Roman Catholics, the Papists, believe that faith and reason are, are two right. incommensurate categories. But what they do believe is that natural reason can know and function correctly in an autonomous way, as he had pointed out, by the light of the intellect alone. alone. Yeah. Now, to be fair, the Roman Catholics and say obviously none of that could be, you know, true ontologically if there was no God. Right. However, yeah, they this will is say an that, epistemological yeah. question. Exactly. Not, um, well, great point. What is the the cause that allows things to exist? Yes, great point. Because Where, literally, literally every debate I've had with a, with a Thomas, that's the first thing they'll say is that ah, but we don't believe that. The natural reasoning capacity exists ontologically on its own without God. Yeah, but that's not what we're, we're analyzing. We're asking the epistem uh, epistemic question. Right. So what the question is, is something called first principles. Where do you locate your first principles? Um, Aquinas on um, the divisions of the sciences um, talks about, and you know, he's correct in this, that the various disciplines... And everybody must know this, that ultimately reason rests on a bedrock of faith. The question that Jay and I are investigating is, well, is the faith well-placed? And where is the, the faith and your first principles? Where are those located? If they're located incorrectly, if you have faith in the incorrect thing, then obviously it's a house of cards. It, it comes crumbling down. So what you have here is uh, explained by Pope John Paul II, and you have this in Aquinas and, and various other encyclical letters in the Magisterium of the Roman Catholic Church, is that when it comes to epistemology, so not ontology, but the first principles of epistemology are placed, the faith is placed within sense, perception, and experience. So just as mathematics, for example, does not try to prove numbers, lines, and magnitudes, but uses those as first principles, Aristotle has his first principles that you take on faith located in what's called either self-evident axioms or sense perception and experience. This is what I designate as autonomous epistemology. Why? Because... Either you have a, a disjunction right here. Either you place your first principles when it comes to epistemology uh, regarding knowledge in God, and therefore a theonomous epistemology, or you place it in man or the world, what I call autonomous epistemology. Let's be clear here that we recognize um, that the, the Roman Catholic position will is not intentionally per se trying to um have some sort of uh, um primacy to autonomy or to say oh man's intellect supersedes god 
I recognize, we recognize that there's many places where the Catholic theologians will uh, uh, deny this and they'll go on to state, you know, the primacy of, of God's existence and so forth. That's not the point that we're making. We're, what we're saying is that there's two conflicting things at work here, two different types of presuppositions. And that's what we're trying to call out here. We're not saying that, the, oh, you never give any place to revelation. You only teach that man's intellect solves everything. And look, no, there is a, an enlightening that they believe uh, occurs, an enlightenment from, uh, from God through created grace to the intellect, whatever that means. Um, but that's, again, begging the question because we're asking an epistemic question of certitude and starting point. And for, for Roman Catholic theology, because of its adoption of the empiricist, scientific, empirical type of method, even for theology, this is where we get the problem. Yeah, that's a great point, Jay, that um, why are they reasoning in this way? Why do they do this? It's because they embrace a certain Hellenistic philosophic project. Yes. And when we say that and critique that, we don't mean that there's no value in philosophy. Right. Um, and nothing's true. But there's a difference between actually being able to use things in philosophy that are true or identify them when they're true versus adopting a project, a metaphysical or philosophic project. Right. And because the Latins do this and it's carried carried through the West, you end up having then a theological enterprise that mirrors and is the natural consequence and logical consequence of Hellenism. And this is what I think <clears throat> I'll read this quote we don't have this within the first millennium of the church. We don't have this in orthodoxy. Why? Because we didn't embrace the Greek Hellenistic philosophic project. Um, I'd like to just clarify, for example, this by quoting Tristan Manglehart after God. He states, Christianity did not begin in the arms of philosophy. Christ did not walk through Palestine preaching natural law. The early church was not a philosophical seminar. The apostles did not embrace the bond of fides et ratio, faith and reason. The Christianity of the first half millennium marginalized pagan Greek philosophical faith and reason. So here do you see again, it's all about, we all take faith in something. Reason takes faith in its own permanence and its, and its first principles wherever it locates. But the real question here is, what are we taking faith in? The Greek philosophic project took faith in reason, and the West embraces this same spirit. And he goes on to state, this Christianity turned, speaking of orthodoxy in the first half millennium, this Christianity turned to Jerusalem, not to Athens. Although yep. this church took terms and distinctions from pagan Greek philosophers, just like I said, it did not ground its theology in their philosophy. So that's a really excellent quote from Tristan Englehart after God that really kind of summarizes what our argument is and why orthodoxy is incompatible with the West. You can't bridge these two. I mean, it would almost be easier to bridge Buddhism with orthodoxy than um, Western Christianity. Why? Because they've embraced an entirely different. So just because they're using same terms, they might. Hey, look, they use incense, and they have vestments. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And they 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 believe in Jesus. Um, but what's you know? Yeah, but what does that mean? Right. What does that mean? Depends Jesus, on what you mean. Like na yeah. nature and persons will come up. And every heresy comes out of nature and persons. Um, and the things that we critique as heretical in the West, guess where they all come from? They come from embracing this Hellenistic project. Yeah. If you, if you didn't get a chance. Faith and reason. Exactly. If you didn't get a chance, as an example, um, so many years ago, I read ba uh, St. Basil's Hexameron. And over and over and over in those lectures on Genesis, St. Basil decries the stupidity, the folly, the absurdity, the inanity, the idolatry of the Hellenistic philosophers and their approach to creation. Because creation is a doctrine that's revealed, right? It's not a doctrine of, quote, natural theology. 
And we've proven this many times over by pointing out that, again, Romans 8 is very clear that all death entered the world on the basis of Adam's sin. That includes death in the cosmic sense of entropy, decay, uh, privation, right? The fathers are very clear about this, that all privation, death, and decay, and corruption in the natural world, even of the animals, is a result of Adam's sin. That's why you can't look at the natural world as it is now and reason up from that to who God is, because that leads to dualism, Manichaeism, and so forth. And that's why Basil many times over, I mean, I'm looking right here at the, uh, the first homily, and he goes into multiple uh, paragraphs just talking about the stupidity of the Hellenic philosophers. Now, Basil doesn't just do this in Hexamron. He does this in the uh, writings on the Holy Spirit. He does it in his letters, right? When he defends the Holy Spirit, he talks about the word concept fallacy of all the heretics and how they're caught in dialectics. Over and over and over, we see the same problem of, of, of again, it's not philosophy, right? Because St. John of Damascus will write a whole book defending the right use of philosophy. He will call philosophy the handmaiden of theology. There's nothing wrong with that. We don't have a problem with that. But what we mean by philosophy is what is key here. Do we mean adopting every principle of Aristotle and squeezing God into Arist Aristotelian either or logical categories, you see? Let me just quote Tertullian, actually. This is really good. Concerning uh, his question, what does Athens to do with Jerusalem? He's actually commenting on Paul's writing. And he states, quote, He had been at Athens and had his interviews with its philosophers become and became acquainted with that human wisdom which pretends to know the truth. Interesting words there. Whilst it only corrupts it and itself divided into own its own manifold heresies by the variety of its mutually repugnant sects. What indeed has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What concord is there between the academy and the church? What between heretics and Christians? Our instruction comes from the porch of Solomon, who had himself taught that the Lord should be sought in simplicity of heart. Away with all attempts to produce a mothed Christianity of Stoic, Platonic, and dialectic composition. We want no more curious disposition, disputation after enjoying the gospel. With our faith, we have no further belief, for this is our uh, faith, that there is nothing which we ought to believe besides. So that doesn't mean we're fideus. Oh, by the way, that is Tertullian on the prescription against heretics um let's see chapter seven yeah we seven. see the same approach in saint Irenaeus in against heresies right the, he said he calls for the total demolishing of of the philosophers now the total demolishing and the rejecting of hellenism does not mean stop thinking in either ors right we're not saying that a philosopher uh, never says anything true we're not, we're not saying that uh, aristotle doesn't say true things but it's not because of their uh paganism it's in spite of their paganism you see that's why at the beginning of the triads, uh, what I'm saying is exactly what all the fathers say, right? What does he say in, in, the, uh, in paragraph four? He says that the doctrines of Plato are demonic. He says the doctrines of Plato, the Hellenic errors, he says, have their source in the demons. That's the beginning of St. Gregory Palamas' triads. And then he goes on to say that philosophy can be good and can be used properly. In fact, he was a proponent and taught and was taught in Aristotelian logic. Yes, St. Gregor Palamas was a logician. Did you know that? Uh, so he was schooled in this. And I've always said this. People just take my, my comments out of context and they don't listen to the nuance and the clarifications that we make because they're looking for ways to try to cause division and lie and say, that, say I'm saying something I didn't say. So again, there can be truths even in demonic systems, right? Originism is a demonic system. But... Many of the church fathers studied and read Origen. Now, that was appropriate for that time period because Origen was not yet fully known in all of his heresies, and he was not yet fully condemned, as he later was at three different councils. So it doesn't matter that St. Gregory Nyssa read a bunch of Origen and that St. Gregory Nazianzus did and Basil did, because it's many centuries later where the entire church, multiple times over, realized that Origen was a complete heretic. 
right? So you can't just pick a period out of church history and say, ah, oh, well, uh, the fact that this church father liked this guy, therefore now everybody needs to reassess and reevaluate all of Origen's uh, uh, Hellenism. And Origen is the preeminent Hellenic heretic. Sorry, go ahead. No, well said. Um, yeah, so Jay, I like that you pointed that out because the accusation is then, well, oh, then you Orthodox are just fideus. Exactly, you're a fideus. You don't um, do you don't do argumentation or apologetics. You're a fideus. Yeah, that's so. I thought you made that point well. That um, well, that whole book, this, that book is an apologetic. Saint Gregory Palamas is doing apologetics as he's calling the philosophers stupid demonic pagans <laughs> as he's doing argumentation and logic he's writing a book using argumentation apologetics and logic great point so back to your paper um so you go into aquinas's epistemology this is outlined again we see this as the consistent roman catholic approach uh you know from the time of aquinas um, up into the Middle Ages, later on, up into uh, the time of Trent and Vatican I, uh, up into Leo XIII's famous encyclical accepting Thomism as the official philosophy of the Church, and then all the way up into Vatican II uh, uh, and, and John Paul II's Fetus et Ratio uh, encyclical, which we've shown everybody these encyclicals now on screen. You've seen those images. So, all right, so we know what we're talking about first principles. We know that we're trying to... Um, Look, Father, why is it wrong to go from created objects to God? It's, Im it's impossible to avoid this. We're all going to reason from created objects. So, so you are, are tripped up, you see, because there's no other way other than the analogia entis, the analogy of being. There's no other way than to reason from created being to the divine essence. Uh, it's because I said it's wrong. That's why. And now I'm going to tell you why. Appeal to authority. Um, oh, again, exposed. So, Dude, I just exposed you. Yeah, Appeal to authority. Appeal to my own authority. <laughs> um, again, this presupposes what uh, they need to prove. For example, and also it reveals that the way that they think through this and kind of piecemeal bottom up kind of evidentialist. And this is a further critique of mine that of natural uh, theology and classical foundationalism is that it has unwarranted found um, assumptions that we can just look at sense data in a neutral and kind of universal way, like kind of lowest common denominator, and then just build a case. And then you can just look and see where somebody got sloppy or erred in reasoning or something like that. But that assumes that everything that we see, the words that we use, the evidence that we perceive and accumulate, um, is always is always theory neutral and universally acceptable uh, accessible in the same way. So what I bring out is, well, clearly that's not the case. So if 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 I show as I do in the paper that every as seller says and he's hearkening um, Kant's and you know echoing Kant on this. Everything that you see is a scene as, and this was really nice too, because Jay uh, was able to describe this with kind of kind of Gestaltian um, psycho uh, psychology pictures in the in his paper. That um, I can't remember the one that you used. The one that I always it's called use a Conciza is, triangle. I'll try to find one for everybody on the screen, and you'll see this point. But yeah, go ahead. I always use the one of the old lady, young lady. Yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. Um, like one is, so it's, in other words, what Sellers is going to say, there is no just scene. Like, of, so let's assume that the sense datum is the sense datum for everybody. 
the problem with the classical foundationalist and the evidentialist is that, oh, we can just look at that and then build from ground up and, and make cases and arguments um, and collect evidence. But what's great about these Gestaltian uh, pictures is that here you have lines drawn and made as a picture. They're the same lines drawn on the paper for everybody. So it's the same sense datum. Yet what we notice is that people see it as something different. Some people will see a young lady and some people will see an old lady. So the sense datum is not changing. And all of this is to illustrate the point that sellers make. There is no just scene. There's always a scene as according to concepts, right. according to your paradigms. Um, so that's the first thing that I critique with uh, classical foundationalism and natural theology. The second argument that I make, too, is that, um, well, all of this assumes kind of an internalist way. So let's say uh, in epistemology, you have kind of internalism, externalism debates, externalism being that the, as long as the proper kind of causal relations between the external world and the mind yeah. are set up, then you could constitute meaning and knowledge. Um, then you have those that are uh, internalists that will know it actually has to do with kind of the internal structure. That's what defines and uh, the external world and its causal relations are kind of irrelevant. But let's just ask the question that, well, what if, by what principle do I appeal to, to determine that my concepts are constructed in such a way or related to such a way or that my cognitive faculties are such and such that I'm even perceiving the world correctly, making um, inferences correctly, making arguments, because all of us would admit that, well, there's a whole host of groups of people with mental illnesses that don't. Mm -hmm. Let me, let me, let me uh, uh, bring it home a little bit to the, the sort of, audience that might not be fully initiated into philosophy. What we're outlining here is the 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 one by one problems with naive empiricism and the approach to a naive empirical look at theology. Right. And this is this is unfortunately the route that the Thomistic uh, uh, approach took and many of the people who defend natural theology, whether they know it or not, that's the the project that they're on. So, of course, they're going to deny, uh, oh, I'm not a, a naive empiricist. No, no, no. I know that you believe in metaphysical things like essences and whatnot, angels and all that. But what we're saying is that from your starting point in terms of your epistemology and how you know what you think you know, you start with em empirical sense data. Now, this is very problematic for theology and uh, uh, encapsulating our starting point for reasoning up to God from creatures. Because remember, we're answering the question of the analogia entis. How do we get to know God? How do we reason to God from creatures? And the beginning point, again, is very similar to the rest of the empiricists. Well, we just start with the sense data. What do we see in the world? We see this, that, right? So what we're doing is we're going, stepping back, and we're saying, now, wait a minute. Before you can start doing that, you need to justify to us some pretty basic assumptions that you've not demonstrated yet, right? And we're going to start outlining a few of these. Father Deacon is outlining one of those right now. Um, but as you can see, the example that I gave with the uh, Cancisa triangle, as it's called, the Cancisa star, this is famous in uh, Gestalt therapy. And you'll notice that this diagram here, it appears to be what? Two triangles. Oh, but wait, there is not a triangle. There are no triangles, at least no fully formed triangles, right? So there's not a star of David here. There's not a Kabbalistic star of Rim fan here. There's. Uh, uh, it does look like there's some Pac-Mans though. There are three black Pac-Men and uh, uh, three Greek letters, right? Or three uh, partial triangles, yeah, with, without their bottom line. So, uh, but the mind has the the tendency to fill in the blanks, right? And there's, there's many, many, many experiments like this. And again, I'm not relying on these experiments. I'm just showing that these kinds of things have been used for at least maybe a century now in different uh, philosophical dis disciplines to disprove basic empiricism. Not that we get knowledge from empirical sense data. I don't think I'm saying that because people will run off. Every time you say something, people run off. He said you don't learn anything from your sense data. We got him. I'm saying that empiricism, that's different from 
deriving knowledge from empirical sense data. We believe that. That would be absurd to deny that. But the idea of starting all of your philosophy and your, your doctrine of knowledge from sense data is stupid. And it leads to stupidity. And it's been critiqued for centuries, a million times over. This is just one example that demonstrates that empirical theology is, is silly. Now, again, somebody's going to say, well, but Father Romanides writes empirical dogmatics. We are not saying that you don't have, in a sense, an empirical noetic experience of God. That's a different classification. That's not what we're talking about. We're just working within right now the uh, Roman Catholic Thomistic and even many Protestants who adopted uh, the natural theolo uh, theology project. And we're saying that it doesn't work. And so Father Deacon is giving you one of the ways, right, one of the problems about internalism um, there's going to be more that we're going to list. If you remember from the Stefan debate, I listed multiple problems and Father Deacon has multiple problems in his, in his paper, in his chapter. So go ahead. Yeah. So one of those is just clearly, I mean, if we all believe that a schizophrenic isn't constituted such to perceive reality correctly or reason up from sense datum, what would you what, what what would you reply to the the hater who's going to say well, yeah dude but like we're not all schizophrenic so so that doesn't even work because like we have like the correct we have healthy cognitive faculties so that doesn't even matter. So we just move the question. Well, that's back and say well that's what we're seeking. What is the mechanism mm -hmm. um, or the principle that you're appealing to to know that we have healthy is it a matter of a vote? <laughs> a majority rule? Well, that seems like a bad argument. Um, in fact, it could be that we're both incorrect. We're just constitute, we have different kind of neurophysiology going on that's and chemical uh, things going on that makes us perceive things differently. Um, just, but just because there's a difference, if one person's saying two plus two is seven and the other one says two plus two is nine, it doesn't mean. Um, well, one's right and the other one's wrong. Uh, they could both be wrong. That's a good so, point. Yeah, well, right. As if one thing being wrong, necess that's an either or fallacy. Yeah, so it's a false dichotomy. And so what we're looking for is, well, what is the principle? How do you determine that you have healthy cognition, and that your faculties are appropriate to, to reason up from sense um, and the problem is, is that what they will appeal to is exactly what's in question. Uh, they'll appeal to either their mind or their mind's ability to um, derive knowledge from sense, sense datum. But you can't use what's in question. I mean, it, it'd be like if you're trying to figure out if somebody's eye is diseased and can't see um, – or you're trying to determine your eye, and you're using your eye to determine that. You're, yeah. <laughs> you're never going like, to solve And, and the when problem. they reply that, uh, well, there's just nothing else that we can do. We have to do that. Yeah, exactly. That's called a circular argument. And on classical foundationalist grounds, circular arguments are not allowed. That's that's why you're that's how you're verging into our territory. That's correct. Yeah. Um, and there's further critiques too that. Um, so let me just give a, a brief rundown of where all this historically originates. It originates um, what we call in epistemology, classical foundationalism, originates in Aristotle's epistemology. Um, and Aristotle in his logical works like prior analytics, posterior analytics, topics and stuff like that, he's defining what's called a deductive what he calls scientific knowledge. Now, it doesn't mean what we mean by scientific knowledge. Scientific knowledge is, is a deductive syllogism. Um, so premise, premise, and then you claim that the conclusion necessarily follows from the premises. It may not, but you're, you're, when you make an argument, you're, you're claiming that. And so the conclusion is true, if it actually necessarily follows from the premises, the premises are false, then obviously it doesn't, it doesn't necessarily follow. And then Aristotle says, and the premises must be clearer and better known than the conclusion. And then goes on to state that 
Yeah, do you want, let's see, I'll, I'll just keep, um, I'll keep going with this. Anyways, now, those premises could be argued to be true because they're the conclusion of yet another demonstration. And you can see where this is going. Then those premises would be the conclusion of another. Aristotle wonders, well, does this just go on ad infinitum? Because notice that when we first brought up um, our original conclusion that I'd stated in the demonstration, that's only true if the premises are true. And those premises are only true if the previous argument was true. So what that means is if it doesn't stop somewhere, then you have no knowledge because it's there's no foundation. And so what Aristotle argues is that it must rest on a bedrock of non-demonstrable, self-evident axioms or first principles, in which case, because he denies any innate knowledge, a priori knowledge, all knowledge begins with sense perception because he believes that the objects of knowledge, i.e. forms, are insensible matter. So he has to say that. The question um, that, again, I bring up is, well, that's it's circular. It's depending that that's true if your theory is true and your theory is true if that's true. So we're not really getting anywhere. Um, so... Where are we? That is classical foundationalism. Right. So it must rest on kind of a foundation. Uh, you can't have a demonstration for a demonstration for a demonstration ad infinitum. Otherwise, there'd be no knowledge. So exactly. it must rest on a, a bedrock of non-demonstrable. And can we add um, principles real quick? And you did mention this, and it is listed in your paper. But if you have the works of Aristotle... Um, we do have, he does have this listed uh, as posterior analytics 71B32, uh, prior analytics uh, 68B35 through 7, physics A1184A 16 to 20, metaphysics Z3, uh, oh, Zeta, um, 1029B3 through 12, and topics Zeta 4. 141b 2 to 142a 12. 12. Because, yeah, let me explain yeah. what those are actually right. because that's a little bit different than the kind of foundationalism that we're talking about. So what you find in Aristotle and this is going to become adopted by the West, specifically Aquinas, is a distinction between what's the real cause of something versus the order in which we know. Because Aristotle believes that all knowledge begins with sense, sense perception and experience, but we know that experience is an effect of other causes. So why is there an experience? It's because it's caused by something. But he makes this distinction, yeah, but how do we know it? Do we know the cause first or the effect? Well, if you believe that all knowledge comes from sense experience, you're going to say, well, in order of my knowing, I always start with the effects. And then I move to realize that there's a cause and what the cause is. Um, the distinction that you will find in um, the passages that Jay cited there, which are in my paper, is what Aristotle calls what is better known by us. So that would be the effects versus what's better known in itself or what's better known by nature. That's the cause. So the Thomas is going to say the same thing. Well, yeah, obviously the only reason why you can know anything is because God's the cause of all things. But you don't start with the cause in order to ground your knowledge of the cause and effect relationship or knowledge of the effects. You always start what's more removed from the cause, what is called what's better known by us. That's an crucial distinction, and, and those are the passages that Jay just cited you can find that distinction that is later than adopted by the papists and specifically Aquinas. And there's a problem with that. Yeah. And the problem with that is 
again, if you haven't determined how or that you can know, then how do I know or determine that that principle is true? It's circular. Oh, it's because my theory is true. My theory is true because it's dependent on um, this distinction of what's better known by us versus what's better known by nature. It's like that's it's ungrounded. It's 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 going in circles. And as Jay said, that's not allowed in classical foundationalism. So right. Classical foundationalism has no foundation in that project framed that way. Right. And this is why you will find um, two different approaches uh, to. Because right now, uh, uh, in uh, a Roman Catholic, I, I can sort of assume, uh, no, I know what they're going to say right now. They go, no, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Maximus the Confessor, uh, St. John Damascus, they both utilize Aristotle. They will quote from him. He's cited in the, the Exposition of the Orthodox Faith. He's cited in the philosophical chapters. St. Maximus cites Aristotle at the beginning of the 200 chapters on theology. So... So you're not telling the truth because he's using quotes from Aristotle about uh, calling God a first cause. So therefore, you're wrong. We just we just refuted you. But again, calling God a first cause is not the problem. I mean, doesn't every Orthodox person believe God is a first cause? Sure. Yes. But again, the term first cause is not theory neutral. <laughs> And if you were to actually read what Maximus says, for example, in the 200 chapters on theology, how does he begin when he calls God first cause? He says, in fact, that God is and is not a first principle. God is and is not a first cause. Wait a minute. How is that possible? Oh, he must be contradicting himself. God is not Aristotle's first cause or substance. And so right away, he will explain at the beginning of the 200 chapters that there's two senses in which we use these terms, right? Because God is strictly speaking, is apophatically known. So clearly we don't mean the cause in the sense that Aristotle meant it because Aristotle didn't believe in a personal God who was apophatically known, right? And Father Deacon is making that very point here, that the the way in which God exists in himself as cause, right, as as known in himself, better known by nature, is as opposed to the to uh, uh, that which is known... Uh, How'd you phrase it? That which is known of God is man. No, that's not. That's Romans one. Uh, better, better known uh, in itself, or better known in as itself, or better known as by nature. By nature, so right? So nature being the, the nature cause. being the causation and the causal relations, right? So God, better known in itself, meaning that God in Himself, God knowing in Himself, that's inaccessible to us. And also, if you do affirm apophatic theology, then you can't reason from creatures, right? The 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 causal similarity in the creatures does not match up to an absolutely simple essence because there's absolute, there's no similarity between the being that God has in terms of absolute divine simplicity and the being that creatures have. Yet at the same time, Roman Catholic theology has to deny the via negativa because they say that the reflections of creatures are in the divine essence, you see. So the actual basis for analogia entis ends up being the divine conceptualism, the exemplars, that we can reason up to creatures because creatures have a reflection in the divine essence. But now wait a minute. All predicates of the divine essence are equated to the divine essence, right? The modal collapse argument. So if that's true, then creatures do not bear a reflection or a similarity to the divine essence, and therefore analogia entis is false. And furthermore, Ab Jade, that um, given... A commit now we Orthodox hold to divine simplicity, but not absolute divine simplicity. And a doctrine of absolute divine simplicity, which again, and um, you're going to get from Aristotelian Hellenistic philosophic thought, is that oneness there can be no distinctions in oneness because one is not com is defined as not composed and Therefore, according to Greek thought, distinction means uh, implies composition. Right, exactly. So, but what follows from that is that, well, the absolutely divine, simple essence that is God, the Lucia, can no way enter into his creation without making distinctions and compositions. 
And so the absolute divine simple essence becomes uh, kind of a locked up monad. And if it's a locked up monad, there is, again, the type of being that that um, absolute simple divine essence has relates in no way with created, created being. contingent being, yep. and you can't argue analogia entis. Exactly. There is no relation. So it's it's I'm kind of taking the converse of what just Jay said. There, there's two ways that that right. doctrine becomes problematic. Another way we can prove this, too, is that let's look at the first page of St. John Damascus's exposition of the Orthodox faith. Where does he begin the Orthodox faith? First thing he talks about is the Trinity. Trinity, right away. When Apo when Aquinas does his, here's a whole book, a whole book, the first book of the Summa Contra Gentiles, nothing about the Trinity. <laughs> so, so with Aquinas, we've got 300 pages of trying to establish generic theism about a simple, absolutely simple essence. And within one page, one paragraph of St. John Damascus, within two sentences, we've got the Trinity. Do you see that those are two different approaches? Do they both use Aristotle? Sure. But the question is not, are we using Aristotle? The question is, the difference between Aristotle's use, East and West. And I will plug Friday. Yes, I was just going to say, Jay, why don't you mention, um, if all of you are curious about how is it that the West uses um, Aristotle and his terms, which are the same terms that we use. How does it the West uses differently from the East? Well, you can read David Bradshaw, Dr. David Bradshaw's wonderful book, Aristotle, East and West. And also, yeah, that's right. Jay and I will be interviewing and discussing uh, with Dr. David Bradshaw this Friday about these issues exactly. So same terms, total different meanings and usage. Well, to be fair, um, sometimes they do mean the same thing as us, but at yeah, other yeah, times that's they mean, don't. I didn't, yeah, I didn't mean, yeah, that's but good, I understand that's, what that's you're saying. Point, you're but... correct uh, that, uh, for example, somebody might say, look, uh, Thomas and Augustine used a form of divine conceptualism, the exemplars, and St. Maximus's Logi are a form of divine conceptualism, their exemplars, so look, we got you once again because Logi are exemplars. And I will say that when I was first looking into this in 2007, when I first got uh, Torstein Tolosan's uh, big treatise, PhD on Maximus and the Logi, I was fooled by this. I thought, well, they're saying the same thing, but they're not saying the same thing if the Logi are not equated to the divine essence. They're not. They're not right. eternal attributes. They're energies that only relate to the created order. Are they uncreated? Yes. That's Maximus is very clear about that. Bradshaw has a whole chapter on that, a whole section on that. They're not identical to the uh, eternal, essential energies of the of, of God, right? They're not the same as God's energy uh, of glory or God's energy of love. They're different. Just like Saint Athanasius makes the 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 distinction between attributes of God that apply only to pro, uh, the created order, like providence. Providence is not an eternal attribute of God. It only relates to the created order. So in the same way, as Father Florovsky says in his essay, Creation and Creaturehood, on the Logi, the Logi only relate to the created order. There's a bit of mystery there because in some sense, they uh, are thought wills that relate to the created order that only relate to creation, but they're also uncreated. But in the same way that the, that the theophanies can be uncreated, the theophanies come and go in time and space. They really did happen. Certain providential actions of God come and go in time and space. They're uncreated, but they're not eternal. That's why St. Gregor Palamas in the triads can say there's different types of energies. Some come and go, uh, right? Uh, and so Roman Catholics, oh, that, that compromises God's immutability. No, it doesn't because God transcends the logical categories, as Dionysius says. And as St. Gregor Palamas quotes against Akindinos, God transcends the logical categories. That doesn't mean that we rush to the uh, opposite conclusion and say that therefore God's irrational and crazy and he hates his own logic. No, transcending something does not necessitate that it contradicts. It just means that the logical categories cannot be completely exhausted. Exhausted, exactly. The realities of God. Exactly. Um, also, it's important to point out, too, that 
with a commitment to, and the reason why we're stressing um, and hitting on the papist, and it also would be the Protestants' uh, commitment to absolute divine simplicity, is that if you define the one, um, that anything that we predicate of God, so that could be the the logo, um, is ex- ex- exemplars within God's essence. Right. They are God's. So everything's identical. Yep. Why? Because you've already pre-committed to a conceptual category and a paradigm in which, well, um, distinctions would imply compositions, and there can't be compositions within one absolute oneness. Therefore, anything that we say about God as far as distinctions are not actually – they're all identical in um, – and as, as Aquinas says – well, these will be just virtual distinctions in us because we're finite and we're limited and we have problems. Um, or you go the SCOTUS route and say um, they're not real, but they're formal distinctions. It's like it's a little bit better. Yeah, than and, and, minus, and we but... can yeah we can we can make this really absurd. Um, are let me ask you as a philosopher. Uh, uh, I mean, are things in the world actually distinct? Yeah, that's right. That's a great point. Now, are the exactly. things in God's essence actually distinct? Mm-hmm. No. So how are created things based on the uncreated forms in the essence? If the forms in the essence aren't actually distinct, but the created things really are distinct. Yeah. Then when we just be in kind of uh, monism. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. It and, always reverts to some form of Platonism or emanationism. And furthermore, if you remember uh, Gregory Palamas's critique of Barlam, and we just celebrated uh, St. Gregory uh, Palamas Sunday this last Sunday, so it's fitting that we, we speak about him. Um, and Palam, uh, St. Gregory Palamas was critiquing Barlam because he had a type of apophaticism in which there's no way that God could be known at all. Um, and in one sense, he's actually he's more consistent than the Thomist. Well, he he's those. in he's he says both. By the way, I don't mean to counter signal, but he does say both things, and that's why Saint Gregory keeps bring, bringing him back to both sides of the dialectic. So at that's times right. he'll times he'll say stuff like that, and then at times he'll turn around and say, "Well, we participate in the essence of God." <laughs> really? I yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, that's a good point. So he'll say both. Um, but what what I was trying to stay uh, to emphasize is that if you're committed to this kind of monistic absolute divine simple essence um in which there are no distinctions because that would imply compositions on your worldview or paradigm um then barlam would be right so we're Mm -hmm. just saying he's being inconsistent when he says later that you can know but the consistent approach would be well that you can't know god (laughs) there's there's no way that exactly again atheism um Natural yeah, theology is atheistic. Absolutely. And he warns that this is carried out will lead to atheism. Um, and I argued um, in a paper that I delivered in Romania at the IOTA conference that this actually historically um, becomes a type of cause that leads later in uh, Western Europe to widespread atheism. That, I mean, do you, does anybody just think that it's just accidental? I mean, my people might be like, well, it's the spread of evil, um, and I would agree with that. But it's really interesting when you study the history of philosophy, you really do see, like, the domino um, of ideas, that one idea causes another. Because, again, if you think about, well, then I just have this kind of notional idea of God, but there is, that doesn't even correspond to God because there's no analogy of entis and any distinctions I make are not real in God, let alone, I don't even know how you'd be able to argue that, um, you could even have the referent. Um, how do you know that your reference of these notions, if there's no actual analogy, uh, correct analogy of entis, then you don't do ever I actually know? know God. Yeah. How do I know that my terms are even pr- um, hitting God? Exactly. Um, it's the intentional object of, and so what you end up uh, having is you're locked within your own mind. Um, 
And I believe I have a quote here that uh, maybe it's from another paper that what this produces in the West is kind of these phantasms and imaginations about what God, you are locked within your mind. You're not actually talking about God or worshiping God, but rather your own ideas. But you see this then played through in the history of philosophy too, right? You have a breakdown between the communion of the subject and object in the world, and then you get what? Stuck in idealism and in all this empiricism, then, then the Enlightenment's critique of reason and then, lo and behold, um, widespread atheism. What I argue is that if you investigate that further, it's not coincidental. And the causes of that were actually traced to the Roman Catholics' adoption of this Greek Hellenistic um, ontology over personhood. Thomas says... Composition or division is a certain operation of the intellect. If then God considers things by means of composing and dividing, it will follow that his understanding is not solely one, but many. And thus his essence as well will not only be one, since it is intellectual operation that is his essence as was proved above. But on this, but it is not on this account, is it not on this account necessary for us to say that God does not know enunciables for God's essence being one and simple is the exemplar of all the manifold and composite things. And thus go, God knows things through his essence, uh, out in terms of all multitude and composition, both of nature and of reason. But we're not asking if God knows all the composites, if his exemplar is the essence of all manifold and composite things, the created world, and the created world actually possesses distinct objects, then for distinction to be real in the world, there must also be extinct distinction that's real in the exemplars of those things. But that just right there, as you can see, this is question, uh, excuse me, chapter 58, in the Summa Contra Gentiles. And I have like, I read the whole book in one sitting 10 years ago. I have it all marked up, all the different places. I should just do a lecture on the uh, Summa Contra Gentiles volume one where we can pick out all the different places where Thomas says over and over and over the very things that we're saying. So a lot of times someone will say, you don't understand Thomas. You're just miss You're, you're not being honest with him. Yes, we are. That's the point. <laughs> we are being honest because he's very clear. I mean, how many times over can he say the modal collapse point that all attributes of God are identical. God is his essence. God is his existence. God is his will. God is his understanding. God is his intellect. God is his nature. Hypostasis is nature. They're identical. They're isomorphical. They're only conceptually logically distinguished. But the created world is not like that. The created world does not have those features, right? And this is a great point that Bradshaw makes that we'll bring up, which is that uh, it, it, when the fathers began talking about distinction in the first millennium, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, simplicity, he notes that simplicity was not first and foremost uh, categorized or understood or defined as not having any distinctions. It was defined as acting and acting upon. So God is simple because he is the agent who acts primarily and supremely. Beings are not... Uh, beings are composed because first and foremost, right? They're not, they're not simple in God's sense because they are acted upon. Okay. So it, in its beginning definition in our fathers, it did not begin with absolutely no distinctions. This is a view of simplicity that comes later. Bradshaw proves that he demonstrates that in the later chapters, that this is a later idea. That's why, as I've shown countless times over, when, St. John Damascus rejects, Saint, uh, excuse me, when Aquinas rejects St. John Damascus's arguments for the essence energy distinction, he appeals to Maimonides and he says, as Maimonides said, any distinction implies composition or division. And therefore, if the energies in God are really distinct from God's essence, then God must be composed. There it is. The whole, our, everything we're making, all, all of these arguments are right there in Aquinas's rejection of John Damascus's argumentation. That shows you that the two positions are not the same. If they were the same, Aquinas wouldn't say, I reject John Damascus's arguments for the essence energy distinction. By the way, I found the quote from St. Gregory of Palamas. Um, to think that God is an object of knowledge. So he's speaking in the sense of Barlam, um, 
um, which is applied also to any doctrine of absolute divine simplicity. So the Thomistic, um, any right. notion of the so b why because this is a denial that energies are distinct from god's essence and the exemplars are distinct from god's essence um to think that god is an object of knowledge um is to turn away from true being i.e the energies to a phantom of one's own making that's why it, so i'm just using one of the church fathers to say um well father deacon isn't that pretty harsh to say that Protestants and Roman Catholics are not worshiping God, but only their idea of God. Uh, no, because they theologically deprive themselves. They're <laughs> on their paradigm, they can't actually bridge the gulf between an absolutely divine, simple essence um, that is identical to being and everything you'd predicate would be identical, and then a composite, contingent world. And therefore, what you end up is worshiping an idea of the phantom of your own making um, and turning away from true being, because you, true being is the energies. That's what relates. So I'm not just making this stuff up. It's Right, so there's, really, not, there's not a generic idea of God as a simple substance. Uh, now, does that mean that the church fathers don't call God a simple substance? Of course not. But what we're saying is that <clears throat> when Romans 1, for example, talks about the unbeliever, Paul does not say that if you just simply present the correct form of Aristotelian syllogisms and causal relation arguments and remotion arguments that an unbeliever will then believe. If, if Romans 1 was vindicating natural theology, that's what Paul would say, but that's not what he says. Paul says that all men are guilty and they know in their heart of hearts, i.e. their noose, that God exists, you see. And so they suppress that truth because they're fallen. And that's why you have to repent to interpret the world correctly. So the, thus, natural knowledge also requires repentance. Does that mean, again, that an unbeliever can't say something true? If an unbeliever says 2 plus 2 is 4, does that mean it's, it's not true? Of course not. It's true, but it's true in spite of his rebellion against God. That's the point. It's yeah. true in spite so of true. his worldview, in spite of his errors. Because when we say deep down, everybody believes in God, we're talking about what Paul calls the noose, the heart of hearts. Paul uses that phraseology more than once, right? And this is a Hebrew idea. This is not a Hellenic idea. This is not the Hellenic idea of pure intellect. The, the noose is the intellect being reintegrated into the heart. And the two faculties functioning in unison is the way St. Maximus describes the noose. St. Gregory Palamas will, will use the same uh, approach as St. Maximus when he talks about the noose. So noose is not like some other part it's, it's the mind being reintegrated into the heart, right? And functioning in harmony. And in fact, the intellect has to be undergo repentance and cleansing, as we will see from St. Justin Popovich when he outlines the uh, epistemology of St. Isaac the Syrian, as Father Deacon will note in this paper. You can't that means that you can't interpret the natural world properly without repentance. Does that mean, again, does that mean that every unbeliever who has not repented says everything wrong about the natural world? No, but it, when I say interpret the natural world properly, I mean in the grand cosmic context because they don't see Christ in the natural world. They don't see that the natural world, as St. Maximus says, is the garment of the Logos. He talks about three embodiments of the Logos, right? There's the Logos embodied in creation, the Logos embodied in the incarnation, the Logos embodied in his saints. Yeah, I, let's actually pick up there that's an interesting thing that we're not saying i like what you said we're not saying that someone can't actually have true beliefs or to say true things um but that's typically not how we define knowledge right knowledge is a true belief with justification and the problem is that if you can't establish your justification criteria for your justification criteria, then what that amounts to is, although you may have true beliefs, none of your true beliefs are justified and therefore never rise to the level of knowledge. Now, the way I like to illustrate this is, um, 
let's see, what example should we use? Should we use coconuts, jelly beans? Coconuts and cantaloupe. Coconuts, I, I know. Okay, so I have a box full of coconuts, guys. <laughs> guys, I got a box full of uh, coconuts. And I ask you, okay, tell me your belief how many is, how many coconuts are in that. And you say seven coconuts, and it ends up being true. But the box is closed up. You couldn't see that. Now, would anybody in their right mind think that, oh, well, that's knowledge. The person knows it. I think all of you would say that, well, no, it was a lucky guess. But then if you gave me, let's say, sufficient evidence for that belief, I didn't just come up with it. But I watched you earlier that day put the coconuts in there, and it reads a certain kind of epistemic standard for what we would call warrant, proper evidence, or justification. For now, the reason why you have a true belief, then perhaps we might actually say, well, yeah, that person has knowledge. So this is really what's at stake. We're not saying that people can't have true beliefs and can't say things true about the world. But if they have not established their criterion for their justification criterion, then none of their true beliefs rise to the level of knowledge. And what we'll argue is that, again, um, and what I argue in the paper, it boils down to only two options. Either you put your first principles as far as knowledge comes in man and the world, which is autonomous epistemology, whereby you're giving an authority or a principle higher than the authority of God, or you're putting it in God's revelation, um, Christ who is the light of man that lightens the world. And what I'm going to argue is there's, there's only one candidate that's going to satisfy as justification for one's justification criteria that would allow one to actually have beliefs, true beliefs rise to the level of knowledge, and that's theonomous epistemology, because with autonomous epistemology, you're, st you're stuck within the matrix, and you're always going to be appealing to exactly what's in question, and that can't be a good justification for one's epistemological criterion. Absolutely. Yeah, I've got I've got all my Maximus texts out here in case we want to uh, go to any of those because he he will essentially reaffirm all these points. Um, not so much yet on the on the epistem. I mean, he will on the epistemology because ultimately we're going to have to ground. That's why he says the content of natural re, uh, the natural world is the same as the content of divine revelation, namely the logos. If the logos is the content of both then there's no strict divide between natural theology and supernatural theology in terms of revelation. Yeah, that's in Maximus. Um, you'll also have Demetrius Daniel Loy in the experience of God. Yes. Talks about and that. Now, let's so, read that. Let me read that real quick yeah. because um, yeah, could you? because he's citing Maximus. This is very key when he said, when he makes these points. The Orthodox Church makes no strict separation but excuse me, makes no separation between natural and supernatural revelation. Natural revelation is known and understood fully in the light of supernatural, or we might say that natural revelation is given and maintained by God continuously through his own divine act, which is above nature. This is why St. Maximus the Confessor does not posit an essential distinction between natural revelation and a supernatural or biblical one. That's why Maximus also says that man's virtues are the ones that are natural to him. The more that man moves into grace, the more he moves towards the virtues which are natural to him, you see. The affirmation of Maximus would not be taken in... Uh, more in this uh, affirmation of Maximus must probably be taken more in the sense that the two revelations are not divorced from one another, right? So they're not identical. The Bible is not identical to what's, you know, trees and rocks. The affirmation uh, instead, uh, supernatural revelation unfolds and brings forth its fruit within the framework of natural, like a kind of casting of the work of God into bolder relief of guiding uh, a guiding of the physical and historical world towards the goal for which it was created in accordance with a plan laid down from all ages supernatural revelation merely restores the direction and to uh, excuse me the the direction to and provides a more determined support for that inner movement maintained within the world by god through natural revelation at the beginning, moreover, in that state of the world in which was fully normal, natural revelation was not separated from revelation that was supernatural. He's speaking of the pre-lapsarian Edenic state. Consequently, supernatural revelation 
places natural revelation itself in a clearer light. It is how it is possible to speak of both a natural revelation and of a supernatural one within the framework of natural revelation. But so he goes on to say that the content of both is the same. Why? Namely the Logi. Maximus will say the same thing. The Logi of scripture is the same as the Logi of the natural world, namely the Logos, but it's two different forms. The content is the same. The forms are different. And again, I read this book 10 years ago or not 10 years, six, seven years ago. Uh, and it answers a lot of these questions. And he makes all these points before Pharrell and other people were making these arguments. Okay. So this is not something, Oh, Pharrell you know, uh, was the, the one who came up with all this. Countless theologians have been making these points before Pharrell was making these points. I'm not saying that Pharrell is incorrect in God has your dialectic. I'm just saying that he's not the only, because people keep saying, Oh, you're just getting all this from Pharrell. No, it's right here. And I'm going to show you where it's in St. Justin Popovich in a minute too. Uh, as uh, again, all of this is in Father Deacon's paper, which we have put, you know, we're going to put in our book. Um, let's, Let's use that to talk about, there's a typical critique that comes up. Well, Father Deacon, aren't you just, aren't you just reading this kind of post-Kantian yes, idealism? Yes, it's all Kant. You're getting all this from Kant. Ref reformed theology back in to fathers. That's the, that's usually often... The critique, which right. is kind of exactly what you were just pointing out there, that uh, with Farrell, that you're just reading that back into. Mm -hmm. But again, what you have is, is something similar to like a word concept fallacy. Just because Kant uses what there's three different types of, uh, at least formally speaking, arguments that you can give in philosophy and logic, inductive arguments which are probabilistic deductive which are claimed not to be probabilistic but follow necessarily and then transcendental which conclusions are established not deductively or inductively but transcendentally for the possibility of arguments or experience those are actually informed now that doesn't mean that um therefore every transcendental argument or every inductive argument or deductive argument is going to be good I'm just identifying the form. Furthermore, it doesn't mean that just because somebody came up with the term transcendental argument that people weren't reasoning in right. that way prior to when somebody named it. That's like saying, oh, nobody used in hypostatize in the first two centuries, so it's an invalid term. Nobody thought that way. Nobody used the term hypostasis in the way that you're using it, like Basil does in letter 30. This is the type of arguments that Oriental Orthodox make. And then just because Van Til, Bonson, and John Frame, the reformer, uh, the reformed uh, presuppositionalists, develop a language called presuppositionalism, doesn't mean that people prior to uh, Van Til were not presupposing. In fact, there's nobody that's presuppositionally neutral. That's why I said everybody presupposes something. As a, as a foundation and starting point. What we're looking at is, are those presuppositions coherent, circular, and could they be proper justifications for one's theory of justification criterion and one's theory of knowledge? And what you will notice in the fathers, and this is what I'm trying to argue in the paper, who cares what Immanuel Kant and Van Til have to say? Yeah, and I mean the people uh, they do the exact they, they they'll turn they'll they'll do the genetic fallacy with us and say that this is all gathered from Kant and Van Til, which is not. And then they'll turn around and gather whatever they want from Aristotle. They'll do the exact same thing. <laughs> they'll be like, "We can use Aristotle." And then we we'll say, "Well, here's right. an interesting argument in Van Til." No, you can't use it. Yeah. So, what my argument is again, who cares what they're saying? The question right. at hand is whether where are the church fathers in the Orthodox Church? Where are they putting their starting points epistemologically? What is their ordo theologiae? And do they have a faith in reason the same way that the Hellenistic philosophers and the Latins do? 
that's all my point. Like, th th who ca like I said, who cares about the terms transcendental argument and presuppositional? Yeah, and, 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 it really boils down to that. And the, and the point here is that St. Justin Popovich stresses in the essay about St. Isaac the Syrian and the intellect and natural knowledge being worthless, basically, until you repent. Natural knowledge, empirical knowledge, is you're going to mess up, right? You're not, you can't see the scope of reality by looking at the fragments of pieces of physical reality, you see, right? That, because it doesn't tell you. Now, deep down in our noose, we should know, right? We should know that this world is created by God. We do know deep down that there is a creator and that we rebel against him, according to Romans 1. But the point is that we suppress, the, it. We suppress it. At the end of this entire essay... St. Joseph Popovich says that the entirety of St. Isaac's theory, which is the same as St. Maximus, because it's the same doctrine of the Logi, he says is that knowledge, the problem of knowledge, this is the key, the problem of knowledge is, an, is a religious and ethical problem. So you can't interpret the world right until you repent. That doesn't mean that you get nothing right about the world. It says that in the big scope, you're not going to interpret the world right until you repent. That's why the noose has to be cleansed. That's the whole point of this essay, is right. It's not that the natural world becomes bad when you when you convert and then oh I don't care about the natural world now. It's good, but it's directing you to the direct perception of God is the point. Which explains exactly how uneducated um, elders and saints within the church can have knowledge mm -hmm. um, and refute the highest philosophers. Um, it's because... It's not about IQ. Yeah, yeah, exactly. They, they're receiving their knowledge by cleansing their noose through repentance, and therefore their knowledge is not coming from their own mind, their own arguments, or sense datum. It's coming from the source of knowledge, the fount, which is God himself. Yes, that's why um, they're receiving knowledge higher than the minds of men and angels, and even peasants, holy peasants, um, can refute the greatest of philosophers. Yeah, and that's why if man had not fallen, we would look at the world, and we would see many different created objects, but we would see them in the logos. We would see the logi of these objects, and thereby interact with, and personally commune with the logos in these things. When man fell, he lost that. We were reduced to a natural state. The, the state of nature itself is not evil. We're not saying Manichaeanism or Gnosticism. But it's a, a, uh, a retaining of the image of God, but a loss of the likeness of God. And so all of creation then uh, experiences this corruption, this decay. And that's why the incarnation, St. Maximus says, is cosmic in scope. Right? St. Maximus says specifically that the entire universe will participate in different ways and in different modes in theosis. It doesn't mean everybody's saved. It means the nature of all things are restored. But then our own individual willing will determine whether we participate in uh, ever well-being or ever ill-being based on our own in hypostatized mode of how we will in this life. So Correct. we're So we're actually determining our eschaton ourselves. So it's not Jesus sitting up there like, I'm going to decide whether I think you're evil and just arbitrarily sort of toss you into the lava pit. It's the decisions that we're making. We are determining our eschatological experience as ever. Yeah, God's will not be. sitting yeah. there punishing. Um, right. You didn't get these things right and did things that I want, so I'm punishing you and um, I'm rewarding you. You I like, I don't like John you. You I like, I don't like you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. St. John Chrysostom says that... Um, it's, you know, God shows no favoritism. He, he's like the rays of the sun that, you know, come out equally upon all objects in creation. But given one's disposition and the way that they choose to live to dispose yeah. themselves in a certain way, you could either become like mud or like wax. And Perfect. if you decide to become like mud, you because the sun hardens you. Yes. Um, where if you decide to, based on the things that you do and the dispositions and the virtues that you develop, the spiritual virtues, you could become like wax. And so it's not God um, in this kind of anthropomorphic way, like I'm punishing, I'm punishing mud, but I like wax. Um, 
it's how, based on your own free will, how you're going to respond to the love of God, which are the rays of the sun. There's basically, you're not going to get that in uh, typically explained in Protestantism. Exactly. And uh, we, should, we, we will uh, include a point, too, about the Protestant view of the Analogia uh, Fide, which is their response to the Analogia Entis. But I would like to say that Maximus is famous for, St. Maximus is famous for saying, there's nothing more natural to man than grace. That alone, that phrase alone, that line alone shows you that it's incompatible with Thomism. Thomism could never say there's nothing more natural to man than grace. Now, you might be confused and say, oh, well, then St. Maximus is totally destroying the distinction between nature and grace. No, he's not. He's not. But again, distinction does not imply tension or division. And when St. Maximus disputes with Pyrrhus, that's exactly his argumentation. If you have uh, the work um, multiple times over. I'll tell you right now, uh, page 57, the disputation with Pyrrhus, um, he will make this point that distinction does not entail uh, division. Page 69, virtues are not external but internal to man. They're not externally infused. They're internal to man. How could that be in, in Thomism or Augustinianism? That's on page 85. You see, there's nothing more natural to man than grace. How is that? Well, because grace is not a dialectical opposition to man's will. And that comes up multiple times in the dispute with Pyrrhus. And he proves that Pyrrhus is a monoenergist by assuming that grace has to overcome the natural energy of the will. But rather, in the person of Christ, there's a perfect symphonia. Because in Christ, as our exemplar, there was a perfect unity without composite without without uh, dissolution or dissolving right the divine and the human operate in a perfect synergy uh, so everything he did humanly he did divine and everything he did divinely he did a human right this is the common phraseology of those fathers so it's both and and not either or is what i'm trying to say mm -hmm. so let's see in your paper you move on to let's see we talk about classical foundationalism um once I really hammered this down from your paper and noted it, so I made a few notes here, and I brought this up in the discussion with Stefan Molyneux, um, maybe you could outline some more of these problems real, real quickly because, um, I mean, we're not really in a hurry, but uh, the ones that, that tend to come up so often that people of this mindset of the, the classical foundationalist, the empiricist theology mindset, they'll say, well, again, you know, we just have to appeal to these properly basic beliefs. I would like you, if you could, because these all come up, I think, in your paper, at least some of them do. Tell us about the myth of the given, the problem of the external world, induction, the status of immaterial objects, and no properly basic beliefs. These are five consistent perennial problems for empiricism that are still left unanswered to this day. I know that you mentioned Quine in the paper. You mentioned this stuff. But, but why, do you, why do we keep mentioning? I know you've done lectures on this. But why are they so persistent, Father? What, like, why do these? Why are these the ones you keep going to? We keep going to. Because they're stuck in a kind of paradigm way of thinking, and um, part of the problem is that in classical foundationalism, it doesn't analyze things in terms of paradigms, mm. so it doesn't see itself as a paradigm to be introspected into and analyzed, and therefore the same questions is going to keep coming up. And well, we can learn a lot from people like Quine right. um, and epistemologists that have coherentist theories and uh, of truth and meaning and uh, epistemic holism, because I'm not saying they're right. I'm saying that um, they got some stuff right, and they a different mode of, about thinking about things starts to develop. Mm -hmm. And that's to uh, kind of at a meta level, start to reflect on one's presuppositional commitments as a whole and paradigm. Um, a lot of this, again, just develops historically when um, thinking about and philosophy about language, for example, that we right. have this kind of classical foundationalist notion of language. One to one correspondence, word, right. One-to-one -one one? correspondence that uh, sign and things signified. Tree points out the intentional object and the world. Um, until people like Ludwig Wittgenstein started asking questions about um, 
and all this kind of co- works together. Right. The the issues in philosophy of language with philosophy of science with epistemology, but Quine had a great point that well, what is and but? What do those refer to? For like, what do those point out one to one correspondence within the world? Um, well, and, so and likewise, developed... likewise, notions like existence or causation. What exactly mm-hmm. is that pointing out? I mean, as as Hume pointed out. That's a metaphysical assumption, but if you're an empiricist, you don't actually observe causation. You observe event A and event B, or object A, object B, in one event, and you're calling that causation. You're not actually observing causation unless you assume that you're observing causation. So what you get with uh, Lord, uh, Van Orman Quine, uh, sorry, Wilford Van Orman Quine, um, like, for example, his two dogmas of empiricism, I mean, the dogmas he's talking about is the dogma, exactly what we're talking about, of reductionism, this kind of one-to-one correspondence. In other words, a word or statement um, has a one-to-one correspondence with a unique range of possible sensory events. That the sensory events would either confirm or increase the likelihood of the statement or word, sorry, the statement, a preposition, uh, Proposition being true. And you have in Quine a rejection of that. So that's called what's um, the doctrinal program. So that doctrinal program that Quine outlines in his two dogmas and purism refers to like veracity of propositions, the truth. Can we just have kind of that basic isomorphic one-to-one correspondence that the data just confirms that, hey, just the evidence confirms the, um, what's the, a correspondence theory of truth is basically what. And then there is something called uh, the conceptual uh, program, which is concerning meaning. So this typically gets uh, distinguished. You have an issue about truth and then the meaning of words. And what he shows is that, again, you cannot derive truth from sense data. Right. Um, Sellers is going to argue this too. Um, And there's a great quote that I'm going to give you that, and the reason why is that since datum is no more epistemic than tables or chairs. Um, but all classical foundationalists believe that all knowledge is derived from sense perception. Now, of course, you have the Aristotelian that's going to say, but since datum is um, epistemic because there's forms. So there's another critique of that. Um, but we really don't need to worry about that because for the rest of the philosophic world, they obviously don't believe in forms. Yeah. Um, and it's still going to result either way in, in question begging. How do you know that there's forms? What principle did you determine? Oh, my, my sense datum theory, my, my empiricism, my, yeah, right. I don't know. By it always, it's latest. always self-referential. What is the myth of the given? Why is this a big deal? So the myth of the given Sellers qualifies that, and again, it's referring to foundationalism. Uh, classical foundation was orig- originating in Aristotle. You can't have a demonstration of a demonstration of a demonstration. Right. So, cognitive beliefs must ultimately, and that can include like demonstrations and inference and stuff like that, must rest on a bedrock of non-inferential, non-cognitive, or what's called basic. Um, basic states. Uh, he states. The point of the epistemological, this is Sellers, the point of the epistemological category of the given is presumably to explicate the idea that empirical knowledge rests on a foundation of non-inferential knowledge of matter of fact. That's the given, and he's going to argue um, through some sophisticated arguments that that's impossible. Um, It's a myth. To have a given is actually a myth. Um, and you can find that, let's see, and 
empiricism and the philosophy of mind. Yeah, I put that book up earlier. Um, and I also, I think, uh, these, I think I'll, I don't know if off the top of my head that one comes up in the Bonjour book, but most of these come up in the Bonjour, the Bonjour book as well. But this book also, which thank you to Father Deacon for recommending that many months ago. Um, and I've really enjoyed the Bonjour text. I mean, I mean, again, I was just showing people on the screen. I mean, whether it's the problem of uh, like so myth of the given, problem of induction. There's a whole chapter on problem of induction here. Um, I don't think the status of material objects will come up in this book, but no properly basic beliefs, um, internalism, externalism, um, mm -hmm. scientific underdetermination too is another one we want to talk about. Yeah, we want to talk about that too. So, um, so, so we got so myth again, of the given. So, what about uh, if you want to say any more on that? Feel free, but I want to move to also to give the explain the problem of the uh, of the external world. Yeah. So, what Quine's going to do? So, you have a problem with what would be called reductionism, this kind of coherence theory of truth, um, and we know that language just doesn't work that way. Um, that he says you've got this web of belief that your Statements and your words only take on their meaning within the greater kind of fabric or web of beliefs and language structures, i.e. paradigms. Um, and we have a series from going to the Galtian um, examples to just even common sense that words for one group of people or one religion or philosophy or ideology don't mean the same as the other. Well, why? The same word because they don't function within the whole system of beliefs the same way, and therefore there's imputed meaning that's entirely different. So nothing is um, theory neutral. It's all theory contaminated. Um, don't say that word at the, during this time. How dare you say, say theory laden? How dare you say this word during this theory time? Theory <laughs> laden. I'm just kidding. So here's another thing that continues along. So. What Quine argues in um, his two dogma of empiricism and um, other places that it's entirely impossible to either justify one's epistemology from a classical foundationalist point of view, um, i.e. derived from sense per uh, uh, perception, right. or um, justify or validate one's scientific paradigm from, from sense mm. data. And this is where he comes up with his, the what's also known as the Duhan Quine thesis of the underdetermination of yes. data for scientific exactly. theories. So notice we're building a whole case. None of this is resting on simply one argument. Exactly. Like They're all connected. Like, yeah. Almost like a legal case, right? It's like, it's impossible. Mm -hmm. You have to be a retard to actually, <laughs> I'm trying to convince all of you, you have to be retarded <laughs> to... Um, buy into classical foundationalism after I give you all these arguments. <laughs> um, you have to, what was the, the title of our, our talk? You went to know. I titled say, it. Knowing, na knowing to say no. Knowing to say no, yeah. Yeah, I'm teaching you that. Um, and when to say no to n people's theories of knowing. Okay, so the idea here is that well, can't we just, Father Dean, can't we just look at the evidence and confirm? Yeah, right. Um, don't we do that in courts? Don't we just go, look, look yeah. at the evidence. This is, your honor, he's Yeah, courts you. disprove you. Um, uh, the whole court that, system shows you're wrong. Uh, how do we know a God exists? Well, let's just look at the evidence. <laughs> yeah, right. Let's just build the let's case. Let's hold a court, court. and uh, Judge Wapner and Judge Judy can determine and decide at the end of the trial. So I always give this to, yeah, that's right. I always give this to my students. Um, okay, we live in a, our scientific paradigm, do we live in a heliocentric or geocentric? Who's right, Copernicus or Ptolemy? And everybody's like, well, the heliocentric, uh, Copernicus. Okay, why? What allowed us to say that's the correct one? Mm -hmm. And hands down every time, well, we just accumulated the evidence. <laughs> like, wrong. Like, that's not how... Um, and you can find this uh, in Thomas Kuhn's The Kuhn's Structures of Scientific, Scientific Revolution, Revolution exactly. as well. This is not how science works. You don't ever go, the history of science just proves this, nobody ever goes from evidence to confirm theory. It's like, oh, I posit my theory, 
Now I want to confront what's the great the science council meets and then they all just uh, altruistically go on the basis of what the uh, weight of the facts are. So they have a giant, they have a giant, uh, 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 what's that thing where Lady Justice holds her scales and they pile yeah. the facts up on the scales and whichever one the scale has, that's how you determine it. That's right. So what you'll notice just looking at the history of science, always assume paradigm and theory first. And by theory, I mean capital T theory, because you would have within, for example, Einstein's theory of relativity, small theories that you want to confirm. But I'm talking at the paradigm level. So yeah. Ptolemaic um, or Copernican, um, Democritus or Bohr. Um, do you see what I'm saying here? Mm -hmm. So big capital T theory. So, and we're doing that. What you're doing right now is the undetermination of data, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. setting up for the argument for the undetermination of data for scientific theories. So, what you see just historically is that nobody ever goes from evidence to confirm capital T theory or paradigm. What you get is you get you throw out the old, as uh, Thomas Kuhn says, and very much like either a conversion or a coup d'état, a, a revolution. And I want a new theory. But notice that the new theory or paradigm that you now have subscribed to will make the evidence look very differently. Um, the classic case is uh, Copernicus versus Ptolemy. The evidence. Now, the idea is that every theory needs to get rid of the, definitely get rid of the theories that can't account for the appearances. If you're like, well, my theory is of gravity, and then every time you throw it, like it goes up in the air, right? <laughs> It floats off into space. It's like, okay, throw that one out. Bad theory. Um, but what Duheim and Quine point out is that looking at the... So you could have multiple theories that all say reality looks different, i.e. the um, Copernicus versus Ptolemaic system. Reality is totally different than those. But the data will fit perfectly in each one of those. So, in other words, given the choice between two theories, we'll be unable to determine what theory to choose based on, let's just look at the evidence. And therefore, we say the theory will be underdetermined by the data, the evidence. So do you see it's always paradigm first and then evidence makes sense and as what it is, what type of evidence yeah. in virtue of the paradigm. All evidences or, are interpreted through the lens of your paradigm. You can't right. in you, fact there could yeah, go ahead. You can't remove nobody has a, a purely neutral privileged position position to uh, remove all of their, their uh, glasses to, to see things just purely neutral. Nobody has that. Right. So what the Duheim point thesis shows is in fact it might just it's it's not just two. There'd be a lot more there could possibly be an infinite amount of theories. Yeah, you could have, yeah. That all fit the data. So you can't go, well, let's just look at the evidence, confirm which one to choose. Well, the evidence is supporting all of them. And they're all paradigms are saying are different. Okay, so this becomes this development in the philosophy of science becomes useful to think about our situation with an epistemology. That why? Because again, there is nobody who's presuppositionally neutral. So everybody has sees the appearances, the data, the words, the statements sees them, every scene's a scene as, as Sellers says, within the web of their belief of their paradigm and language structure. So it doesn't, it's nonsensical and, and, and totally retarded to say, well, let's just look at the evidence. I mean, think about it. How does this apply to the issues of God? Well, for us, we're like, the sunset's the evidence of God. Is that evidence for an atheist? No. He says it's not. Like, right. why? <laughs> why isn't he saying that? Um, and even when we're doing 
um, let's say, an analysis of a text. Well, there's the evidence right there in the text. And somebody's like, I don't see it. I don't think that's evidence. How does that happen? How is there a discrepancy? Um, the classical foundationalists will just be like, well, they're erring in some way. But nobody ever works out how that's possible. It's because they're seeing things through paradigmatic lenses. Right. And they're seeing it differently. Every scene's a scene as. Um, so this is a crushing blow. Given both what Sellers, his critique of what's called the sense datum theorists, which is basically classical foundationalism, right. which natural theology inherits, the history of science itself, um, wh- how language actually operates, both in t- terms of meaning and truth, what develops in the two dogmas of empiricism, um, and the Duan Quine thesis of the underdetermination of data, those are the crushing blows to their epistemological project. Yep, exactly. I have no idea how they would even begin to reassemble themselves. Um, and when we, when we find uh, the Thomas and these kind of people trying to salvage these things, uh, they just really reify, restate, and just say well we all know there's properly basic beliefs there has to be and they say they'll say if there are no properly basic beliefs then we can't have knowledge at all oh thank you exactly that's a presuppositional circular argument uh that's a transcendental argument (laughs) that's what we say Uh, that's not allowable on the classical foundationalist paradigm so they don't understand that on their own paradigm you can't resort to circularity at the paradigmatic level yeah that's right so yeah yeah, go ahead. They never can think on the paradigm level right. because, so example, there's been um, cultures where we've tried to go into and translate certain things, um, and been able with certain concepts and words to to kind of tr- uh, have translators, um, and that's because within their um, within their culture, they didn't have a reality within their culture, i.e. paradigm. And Quine makes this case, too, that uh, what is the name of the, I'm trying to remember the principle. Um, he refers to Gavagai. Yeah, it's, I, uh, in there, the rabbit, uh, the, the example of the rabbit running and that may not be in Quine, but there's another example that's used. No, this. that's exactly what it is. It's it's Gavagai's guy's a rabbit running, but yeah. I think it's called uh, oh the indeterminacy of translation. I think mm. is the principle. So you're in you're in South American jungles, and you see like the natives like chasing a rabbit, that's and they're it, all yeah. yelling, "Gava guy!" Yeah, that's it. And from your culture, you're like. Well, holy smokes, uh, Gabba guy must mean rabbit. And then Quine takes you through kind of an ex- philosophical exploration of, well, does it? Does it mean rabbit? Right. And that um, tribe, it, it didn't. Means <laughs> right. food? Yeah. What if Gabba guy means food? Or what if they have some bizarre theory of like uh, ancestral reincarnation and they're saying grandpa? Mm-hmm. Or what if Gabba um, guy is the name for the whole experience of a rabbit running through the, the woods. Exactly. That's what Quine brings up. So again, all of that to, to illustrate, there is no one-to-one um, kind of translation between uh, evidence and the meaning of words. Um, it always operates within the whole kind of language structure, the web of beliefs and one's paradigms. But, so this is why um, there's kind of an analogy, though, because in the classical foundationalist paradigm, they have no uh, concepts or language structure about paradigm analysis. This is why they'll always resort only to the tools that they have in their paradigm. Exactly. And we're trying to teach them that, first of all, it's inconsistent. So that's one way that we critique paradigms that show that they're inconsistent or incoherent. Um, and so it ends up being kind of almost like a rehab program, I feel like. A rehab program for classical foundation uh, and natural theologians <laughs> is that they don't have the conceptual tools to realize that they don't have the conceptual tools and that they're involved in 
Well, how it's do like you an epistemic Dunning Kruger? Yeah. Um, you just have to rehabilitate them. Mm -hmm. You have to kind of just practice and practice to get them to start analyzing things in terms of paradigms, very much the way that we would teach children language. Um, unlike the way we learn language right now, we just go to a dictionary and look it up. Um, a child doesn't do that. When you give them a word, they imitate and they have to practice right. over and over till they go from, um, being nominalist to basically developing a universal concept. <laughs> oh, that's a good one. Also, right, because they're just yeah. doing yeah, they're just doing names. They're all all children, all infants are uh, uh, the three year old are nominalist, and then right. they get to graduate to become uh, believe in universal. Yeah, I mean nominalism, concepts. materialism are actually pretty infantile worldviews. So we've done myth of the given, problem of the external <laughs> world, and induction, uh, and then you just hit, hit on the other one, which is the status of immaterial objects. These are all going to be problems for empirical, empiricist-dominated, uh, naive empiricist types of worldviews. So, um, okay, myth of the given. Um, how do we know there's an external world without just assuming that the sense data is in our minds? Um, could you speak to problem of the external world and induction? What are these problems? Why are they problems? So, remember what I said that all of us have a presuppose something, have a pre-commitment to various ideas. What I'm pointing out is, yeah, but are you justified in that? Of course, right. you. everybody believes in something as a pre-commitment to the use of logic, um, argumentation, accumulating evidence. And as you pointed out, one pre-commitment is that um, there's actually an external world, mm -hmm. that there's uh, other minds, mm -hmm. that you're not just solipsistically locked in your own mind and everything else is automatons, that uh, there's actually laws um, of nature and physics, that there is regularity, um, I, regularity um, over time in nature, that there's identity over time, that right. when you look at a picture of yourself at seven years old, you even though you look very you, differently, yeah. you associate that's the same identity as me now. Um, all these are presuppositions. Now we're going to look at, well, wait a minute, given your paradigm. So what's your paradigm? Are you an Aristotelian? Are you uh, naive empiricist? Are you... Platonist. <laughs> now, a Platonist. What we're going to do is, can those paradigms give a coherent account for how that's possible or as you point out jay are you just going to simply be like well we all just know right which usually ends up being the answer so yep. when somebody can't actually provide sufficient justification what do they do they just repeat the same line over and over again well isn't this become um also uh causal laws every effect has a cause um and that the effect is never greater than its cause. So you have a principle of sufficient uh, reason. And that um, there is causality and regularity of causality in nature. Okay, look at the paradigm of the naive or radical empiricist, depending on which. So everything's just matter in motion. So they've denied that there's actually any immaterial forms or essences or anything immaterial. So what do you have? Matter and motion bouncing around. Well, in a world like that, can you coherently... So now you're committed to what's called accidentalism. I mean, really everything... And again, Darwin takes up this task too. And he right. takes up the task because um, the world... Going back to uh, with, um, well, I'm going to blank on his name, Sir uh, Francis Bacon, mm -hmm. uh, a philosophical world that's denied teleology and forms, yeah. mechanized nature. Um, and so Darwin's going to take an account of, well, how can I explain things that look to be on purpose without any purpose? Yeah. Um, and he has a world, tries to give a story. So this is what everybody does. Everybody has a story. 
that they tell themselves to make sense of reality. Even the naturalistic so materialist has a story. I mean, even the nat- yeah. yeah. What we're going to ask is, does that make sense? Because stories um, assume that things do make sense. What yes. the heck does... Hello? Yeah. What the heck? Yeah, imagine if you're reading a story or watching a movie. It's like, this doesn't make any sense. Who is this person? Who Like, I don't even understand. Like, And you're like, that's a bad story. It does not make any sense. Yes, only David Lynch can get away with telling stories that don't make sense. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. Um, so, for example, the empiricist can't make sense of the world of appearance that he and all the things he's presupposing. For example, what the heck does laws of physics even mean in, um, in an accidental world? Yeah. Just bouncing around. What does knowledge even mean if it's just chemicals and atoms and motion? Then we got the same problem that, I, that I've brought out. Well, then why is one person said to be wrong and the other um, and typically this what it'll do. Oh, it's a causal relation, right? Yeah. Um, knowledge can't, can't be epistemic based in sensation because atoms are no more epistemological than trees or chairs or anything like that. So it's causal. But the problem with that is that I give the, the counterexample of the mad brain surgeon artificially inducing causally you to believe false beliefs so every time he puts the electrode you're like triangle has two sides triangle has two sides um triangle man now, triangle man doing the things that a triangle can yeah you could equally have you believe uh have a belief that um triangle is a three-sided geometric figure 